the data is actually the most important piece here because you get yeah. very detailed information and measurements about the performance of the surgery from the plan and the diagnosis, from the imaging before the surgery was ever done, through the entire surgery and through the outcome. So this is the first time in history that anybody, any company has been able to invent and bring to market a technology that could actually connect all that longitudinal proprietary data mm. that says, what was the intent? You know, we know the plan, so we know your surgical intent. What were you trying to accomplish here? This Week in Startups is brought to you by Superside. Design and creative are crucial for growth. Tech companies like Shopify, Amazon, and Meta have found the perfect solution. Superside. Get $2,000 off with Superside Startup Accelerator Package at superside.com slash twist. Vanta, compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. And LinkedIn Marketing, to redeem a free, $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash next unicorn. All right, everybody, you've heard all about computer vision, cameras, AI, all of this stuff has been coming together to enable founders to create new innovative projects. One of the projects that we've been watching robotics, surgery um, is really uh, compelling. And today, we're going to see how real time computer vision is working in the OR, the operating room. So with me today is Gabriel Jones. He's from Proprio. Am I pronouncing correctly? Proprio. Yep. That's Proprio. Right. P-R-O-P-R-I-O. Uh, and you can go see their website, proprio.vision.com. Tell me, Gabriel, uh, what is uh, Proprio? And what are you building? Thanks, Jason. Yeah, hoping to blow your mind here with some real-time product demos. So we are just outside of the Proprio headquarters operating room facility, Mach OR, if you want to think about it that way. I think it's on the door behind me, the Precision Lab, as we refer to it, where we do real-time surgical simulations. And when I say simulation, it means there are cadavers and samples like that being used uh, in computer vision surgery live behind me right now as we sit here. So I wanted to give you a better version of the product demos that everybody else who comes on your show shows you. I'm not just going to share a Zoom screen. Uh, there's a Wild. body in the lab being operated on by our team right now. And this is not just a demo for the sake of a demo. We're developing applications, including already FDA cleared applications for performing surgeries like spine surgery in a totally wow. different way compared to how it was done in the past. And happy to dive into more detail there. But the simple analogy, you know, that I think is really easy to communicate with uh, your vast audience is up until very recently, all of surgery was operating in a map quest kind of a context. What does that mean? We expected surgeons to basically take an x-ray or a CT or an MRI, that type of imaging, effectively either print it out or have it on a screen, store this wealth of knowledge in their brain from 20, 30 plus years of experience, try to pull all that together computationally within the one human brain and then apply it to take care of the patient. Oftentimes, they're quite literally printing out an x-ray and taking it into the OR. You and I are close to the same age. So we remember when you went from Rand McNally to MapQuest, that sure. was amazing, right? I have a custom map for the entire world. Uh, you know, I just had to print it out, <laughs> type in, you know, the, the, the origin point and the destination, take it in the car with me. And it was amazing, right? Turn by turn. Yep. Except for if anything changed, if anything mm. changed at all, whether it was, you know, a construction project that wasn't on MapQuest or uh, an accident that occurred, or I wanted a sandwich. Mm. Right? There was no real time aspect to that information or that data or how it was presented to us. Now, fast forward, your good buddy Elon and others have uh, taught us how to navigate in real time with GPS and Starlink and all that good stuff. So now we have real-time updating for driving across the city or the country, and thankfully plenty of charging stations. Well, we forgot to do that for surgeons, which is mm. frankly unforgivable given that they take care of you and me and our children and our grandparents. And so now's the time, we'll, we'll probably talk about why now, 
all these technologies coming together, as you alluded to, can actually provide real-time GPS, real-time 3D volumetric intelligence for a surgeon to perform at their very best every single time, really in pursuit of perfection of, of medicine. I think that's Incredible. the exciting moment we're in right now. And for people who are not watching, just go to YouTube and type in This Week in Startups and you'll go find this episode yeah. uh, in our, in, under the videos tab. But behind you, literally, uh, <laughs> right behind Gabriel is a surgeon working on a cadaver. Yeah. So um, first of all, I want to thank all organ donors out there. Yeah. Uh, they make things like this possible. I'm an organ donor. It's on my driver's license. Um, so with a lot of, of sort of humbleness and respect, we yeah. and other companies developing both drugs and you know medical devices and software for these kinds of applications are able to uh, acquire. Don't ask me how I get them, Jason, but you yeah. know body, bodies show up here. You don't want to know the details. Uh, <laughs> and and fortunately, we're able to develop applications that can perform in cadavers, and then you know, there's a whole FDA clearance process to get that into the operating room to work with live humans and solve problems for them. But what you're seeing is that testing and development occurring behind us. And for those listening on the podcast and not seeing, you have members of the Proprio development team in a mock operating room right behind me using the Paradigm system, which is the name of our core platform uh, made by Proprio, to perform surgeries. And we're going to talk more about that, but, but here we have a spine surgery, very common. Uh, think about like a lumbar fusion. You've probably had friends who have had a procedure like that. Yeah. We're on the very other end of the spectrum, something like a scoliosis correction procedure. There are 7 million Americans who have that affliction. And these are in the same sort of family of orthopedic surgeries that happen millions of times a year. And again, they're, they're done with essentially that x-ray that we were talking about, that map quest type so, of information. Just to be clear how this works, yep. you uh, will take a 3D model of a person's body mm -hmm. say their spine that would come from an mri i take it or uh, an x-ray or some combination of those and build a model of my specific body mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody else's because everybody's body would be unique and whatever surgery is going on is unique and then you will create a way for the surgeon to see this now does the surgeon wear goggles do they wear an apple headset how do they actually see this manifestation of say the spine and, and maybe we could do a little product demo here that yeah. we could sportscast people through. Yeah, let's do it. And, and I love the sportscasting analogy because uh, it connects to a core principle, which is we've instrumented the athlete and the astronaut, right? There's people, mm. uh, LeBron James has a whole team of people following him around. Uh, I bet he can't take, you know, he can't go to the bathroom without somebody sampling that and saying, you know, how he's doing yeah. <laughs> digestively. Yeah, and, and it makes sense, right? And he's probably spending millions of dollars a year uh, as our his sponsors to perform at the absolute peak that he can for as long as possible. There is a literal 3D computer modeling um, system for watching people shoot three pointers. And yep. the reason the NBA uh, has gotten so much better collectively, even the worst three point shooters are better than the average 10, 15 years ago, because of that 3D modeling system that is in the gyms that shows people there are their stance, mm -hmm. their footing, you know, the release, etc. So computer vision to help people hit three pointers. And here we have computer vision uh, to help people do perfect surgeries or more perfect surgeries. That That's well said. Um, if you didn't have a day job, I'd be recruiting you, Jason. <laughs> so what are we seeing here? I see like a some sort of an overhead. Uh, is this a projector? Is this a computer screen? What is this overhead device here that? Yeah, seems you're, to be? you're seeing the paradigm robotic computer vision system, which has okay. an array, completely proprietary array of sensors. Think of this as like the LIDAR type systems that are on Teslas and such. Yep. And, and basically, we've designed and engineered a system that can dynamically reposition throughout the operating room, a set of sensors. Think of them like the satellites flying above, right? And we're sure. mapping the mountains of the body dynamically, right? And we can use other types of imaging, you alluded to MRI and CT. Basically, our core capability is this real-time 3D volumetric imaging. You're familiar with Lytro from back in the days um, and the ability to basically capture an entire scene dynamically live in 3D. And then you can do magical things with that once you have that core kind of VR video, if you want to think about it that way. But it's live, and that's our mm -hmm. core innovation. So we invented the system to capture that and to render it live and to 
give a surgeon or a user the ability to interact with it live. So okay, now you so do- there's this overhead sensor array looks like the yep. size it looks like a pizza box, basically. <laughs> um, and that has a bunch of sensors, it's flying over my body, I'm laying across an operating room table. Yep. And it is in real time looking at if you've opened me up, you know, my spine, whatever it is, and it's yep. going to make a 3d model in real time of yep. what uh, the surgeon is seeing. So it's an extra set of eyes for the surgeon, essentially. Super high precision x ray vision without the x rays. Think about it that it. way. All right, if you're listening to this podcast, you care about innovation and one sector that really needed a shakeup was design. I'm always talking about world class design and how that is the difference between getting funding, getting customers, and maybe not getting funding and not having customers. In the past, what were your choices? You could work with an old school agency, expensive, slow, right? Or you can go to freelance marketplace is great. But uh, let's just say it'd be variable quality. It's just a lot of work. Yeah. And so you have these two choices, you can go low, you can go high. But what if there was a better way? Well, let me tell you about super side, it is the new way to get designs done quickly. They call it CAS, C A A S creative as a service. It's a fully managed end to end service. And it's completely hassle free. When you subscribe to super side, you'll get an amazing dedicated design team built specifically for you. And you'll get access to a platform that makes it so easy to request designs and have them delivered quickly. Amazon, Meta, Salesforce, Shopify, all use SuperSide for a reason. Uh, and so do a bunch of fast growing startups and SuperSide, just so you know, they only hire the top 1% of designers from around the world. And they have a full range of capabilities, whether you're doing creative landing pages, motion design or custom illustrations, SuperSide has an amazing offer for twist listeners, you're going to save $2,000 a month with super side startup accelerator package go to superside.com slash twist that's superside.com slash twist for two thousand dollars off so generational shift in medicine let's just go back in history so what we're looking at here is uh the last 25 30 years of progress in what's called surgical navigation right that's essentially what we're describing uh gps has been this map quest so we're seeing x-rays that were used to essentially pin an x-ray to the body and then rely on the surgeon to take that x-ray, do all that 3D calculation, and then perform a surgery somewhat magically, you know, doing a lot of that in their brain. And mm. what you're seeing is, is a spine surgery that's being navigated in that way. Really simple, um, in, in an elegant solution 30 years ago, but we haven't really made a lot of progress since then. And so this is a, you know, a product from a company like Medtronic or Stryker or Johnson Johnson. And that was the whole universe of innovation. So what we're seeing here is actually that real time light field rendering that Proprio does. Hmm. Here you see real data, actually, this is this is light field data from multiple cameras and sensors capturing depth information, RGB information, like from your cell phone, infrared, non visible spectrum, it's all baked into the same algorithms that then present that information to the surgeon. Here you can see the system operating at the edge of these robots moving around in the operating room, it feels like something out of Star Trek, because it's on the path to that. Hmm. And here, what we're showing is the ability to look into a very small incision, this would be a minimally invasive surgery. And what Jason's seeing is a essentially a CAD rendering, wow. a 3D model, that's the blue of inside the body. And all we are seeing all proprio is seeing is about an area the size of your thumbnail. Yep. I assume you have you have pretty uh, normal and healthy thumbnails. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so about five millimeters square. And once we've got that, we've locked onto it. Mm. And we have telemetry for the anatomy to perform the surgery. That's wild. So you have this 3D model that's been built already of that spine, that piece of the spine there. Mm -hmm. Then when they cut the person open, they're laying on their stomach. Um, this array of sensors is reading it in real time and then attaching that view to the 3D model view that's already been taken ahead of time. Yep. And then by putting those two things together in real time, the surgeon then has a more accurate view of the spine in this case, to make whatever, um, whatever incisions or uh, manipulations are necessary to, to help that person. Yeah, accurate and live. That's the big distinction. So what's it. hard to do about this, all of this computational work to do it live, uh, back to the why now question, right? Our good friends Jensen and, and their team over at NVIDIA have helped to accelerate a lot of this work 
we're going to get into AI and, and really practical AI applications, I think, in this conversation, too. But, but the NVIDIA got, GPUs, you're saying, have made it easier to yes. create these real-time models. You have that massive GPU power. Forget about AI. This is just making the renderings at high fidelity in real time uh, being driven by GPUs, which were put into computers to play video games. So video games yep. creating better surgery is if you wanted to find the lineage of this, if yep. people weren't demanding to play Call of Duty at higher and higher resolutions <laughs> and frame rates, right. this technology would have not advanced to here. This would be a very expensive rig to play Call of Duty, but you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so let's Keep, yeah, going keep going here if I can show you this. So what we're, sho what we're showing is the ability to, you had mentioned AR, VR. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Once you've done the hard computational work up front, then what we're seeing is, is the spinal anatomy aligned to the real physical world with the digital. And we mm -hmm. have a surgeon with a headset on, which yep. is a headset developed by Proprio, to look inside the anatomy as he's placing what's called a pedicle screw. So uh, this is an implant used in a spinal fusion hundreds of thousands of times per year, about 1.6 million of these are done per year in the US. Very, very common. But the problem is, if he's not using Proprio, this surgeon can't see inside the anatomy and sort of predict the potential impact of what he's about to do. And that's the wow. true magical revealing kind of the seeing around corners component of what Proprio does. This surgeon is going to be able to avoid putting that screw in your spinal column, Got it. which is a big deal. So when they go to put this screw in, he's going to be watching it in AR or VR? Is this going to be augmented and he's looking at your actual body and it's helping him align the screw? Or is it all done in VR? It can be done all ways. You know, the, yeah. uh, a surgeon who's maybe 20 or 50, 25 years into their career might not want to wear a headset, hmm. no matter how good the Apple headset you know, becomes over time, for example. Yeah. Our bet at Proprio is that the data is actually the most important component and how you choose to consume it is up to you. Got it. So some folks might want some surgeons, old school surgeons, they've got a feel for this. They're going to look at the monitor and they're going to see it. Maybe some new surgeons coming up, they might like to put on a, a headset eventually mm -hmm. and see the model in real time and then see yep. through it with AR. So they're kind of, it's a perfect augmented reality application when you think about it. Um, well, obviously I'm biased, but yes, I agree with you. <laughs> got it. So how close is all this to, you know, working in the field? You literally have a cadaver. Uh, thank you to the people who are donating. Uh, we don't want to make light of that in any way. It's pretty serious business here. And thank God people do donate, um, you know, their, their human vessels after they're gone to, to help technology like this, because this is going to greatly reduce errors. Um, and I guess lower costs eventually of, of different surgeries or make more surgeons in the world is it is what what do you think the ultimate impact of this is does it make people faster and better or does it make you know being a surgeon uh you know a career that maybe more people can uh more accessible to people ideally all of that in my yeah. background i worked with the gates foundation and bill gates and we were trying to solve very big problems over time you know, 25 years out in healthcare globally. Mm. And so we kind of have that motivation as an organization to extend access to care. Today, we're constrained by the ability to make new surgeons that are excellent and skilled. Mm. And J.K., I don't know if you're a, you know, a Scotch fan, but I hear you and Chamath like to drink some good wine. Yeah. But similarly to Scotch or whiskey, it takes 25 years to make a good bottle. Yeah, but you can't. If you and I decided to double our consumption tomorrow, um, the production process to make more great Scotch whiskey is going to take 25 years to get that product to us. Mm. It's a good analogy for thinking about my co-founder, Dr. Browd, who's a world-renowned pediatric brain surgeon who's on the screen right now that we're seeing. He's in his early 50s, and it took probably 25 years of training from pre-med until now, where he is world class. Ah, so time to world class could drop precipitously dramatically yeah because training um is going to be more available and yes. so i assume with this system you're going to be able to replay surgeries and i'm assuming that's how surgeons i think learn is they replay surgeries they 
But here ideally, you're really playing. but you'd be surprised how little data is actually available for them to actually ah. kind of beam back in to what Dr. Brown was seeing in that surgery and see it right mm. out of his eyes as many times as they want. So the 10,000 hours is very difficult to acquire today. So, so right now, if I wanted to become a brain surgeon, a literal brain surgeon, yep. it's not like there's some corpus of here are a bunch of surgeries where you can see deeply into the brain, stem, whatever, spine, wherever this work is occurring. And so the only way to do it is to to st stand to the right of somebody or be watching yeah. from one of those OR, you know, rooms where they have the, I guess, yeah. uh, stadium seating, as it, it seems were. Like, it seems like a, a crazy way to try to learn how to do surgery. Yeah, um, you would think they would we just have videos. So when if you're an auto mechanic, or you, my mom repaired her own dishwasher, <laughs> she was like, literally in Brooklyn, I was talking to my mom, she repaired her dishwasher by watching YouTube videos made for the melee uh, person. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yep. I just watched the video. And I bought the part online. And I did it. It's kind of the equivalent here, y you're going to have training videos that are so good, that you would have people time to amazing surgeon could be cut in half or cut by yeah. I don't know. yeah, and this is the, the why this technology is particularly powerful from a training perspective is light field gives us the ability to essentially create as many arbitrary camera positions as you want mm. in the volume in the space. So that means I can see right out of Dr. Brown's eyes. <coughs> I can mm. see what another doctor is seeing live in that procedure and I can see it from anywhere in the world. So from a training oh, wow. perspective. Yeah. So l let me just double click on that for a second if sure. i was a surgeon if there was a rare surgery occurring I, I, brain surgery is rare i think um you could have and this doctor who's a legendary doctor was going to do this brain surgery one day you could have a hundred brain surgeons from around the world getting to see their perspective and how they handled this and everybody levels up from this very rare case and this very rare instance of getting to watch the pilot as it were Mm -hmm. navigate landing a plane in an emergency type situation that is wild to think about yep if you're a SaaS or services company that stores customer data in the cloud then you need to be uh SOC 2 compliant you knew that from a third party and you need that third party to close big deals and if you want to get compliant easier and faster you need to use Vanta, V-A-N-T-A. -A. Vanta makes it so easy for you to get and renew your SOC 2 on average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. And Vanta can save you hundreds of hours of manual work and up to 85% of compliance costs. This is a total no-brainer. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2 compliance. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on major customers. We all know that. Listen, it's a hard year. Last year was hard. You can't lose those major customers because you don't have your compliance dialed in. Just work with Vanta. Get your compliance automated and tight and tight is right. Lock down those big deals. Here's the best part. Vanta is going to give you $1,000 off. That's 10 hundies. Get $1,000 off at Vanta.com slash twist. That's Vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off your SOC 2 and let me go even further jason so we capture about 250 gig of data per hour of surgery per system running out there mm. so that's on a compressed basis so the real number is, is quite a bit bigger than that again thanks to our friends from nvidia and intel for mm. helping uh, crunch through all those data but the data is actually the most important piece here because you get yeah. Very detailed information and measurements about the performance of the surgery from the plan and the diagnosis from the imaging before the surgery was ever done through the entire surgery and through the outcome. So this is the first time in history that anybody, any company has been able to invent and bring to market a technology that could actually connect all that longitudinal proprietary data mm. that says, what was the intent? You know, we know the plan, so we know your surgical intent. What were you trying to accomplish here? And I'll show you a very specific example right now, actually. Yeah. So here's what we're looking at is scoliosis in an adolescent girl. Oh, uh, this is in the public sphere, so there's no uh, PHI Privacy that we need issues, to. Yeah. Yep. And this is what we're trying to accomplish in the surgery. So folks at home who don't have the video on, you're seeing a, a what's called a deformity uh, in spine. So this is a, a young girl whose spine is, is curved quite dramatically. Uh, it's impacting the rib cage and the shoulder blade and, and just leading to a lot of discomfort. Um, we don't know why the industry and academia does not know why 
medical community does not know why the scoliosis of this variety impacts young girls at 10 times the frequency of young boys. Wow. And, and literally, this poor child's uh, or adolescent's spine is an S when mm. it should be straight, I guess. W it, when looking at it from this perspective, from the back perspective, obviously, there's a, there's a, there's a healthy curve to a spine, but that's Correct. not this. This is looking at it from the back. It looks like it's an S as opposed to a straight spine. But you've touched on something very important. The uh, S is a healthy shape for a spine. From the side. Yes. But it, can, it can be contorted and twisted in 3D, ah. which it makes for very difficult corrective surgery. And mm. so what we're looking at here is actually a scoliosis surgery in parts, a couple snapshots that we've taken. And we're showing a very open surgery with a curved spine wow. that is unhealthily curved. And the way the surgery is done today is literally printed out images with target angles on them that are either brought up on a screen or on a literal piece of paper. So there's your map quest analogy. And the surgeon is going to do their best to try to figure out and orient themselves in 3D relative to a bunch of pieces of moving anatomy. And it's just an incredible math problem that's very hard for even the most brilliant surgeons to solve effectively. So just so I can recap here for people watching, you have the spine, you've got 12 or so vertebrae it looks like uh, if i'm using the proper terminology here that need to be realigned mm -hmm. and they're instead of being curved looking like a you know a tree that's leaning into the sun we got to get this tree to go straight to get it to go straight they print out each of these uh vertebrae as you said like printing out a map printing mm -hmm. out your map quest as opposed to using gps in your dashboard um and they have to make their best estimate guess on how to align that spine Mm -hmm. That is an imperfect, you know, despite being noble and, and, you know, people doing it accurately, let's face it, they're not winging it, but there's a little bit of a freestyle going on here where they have mm -hmm. to make, I guess, their best estimate on how to, how to realign the spine, correct? That's right. And their only other real tool is intraoperative imaging. So hitting the patient mm -hmm. and the entire staff with a whole bunch of radiation. Ah, right so which is taking like x-rays during this live yes and so as often opposed to the better way which is what is removing the need for intraoperative radiation mm -hmm. entirely so mm -hmm. real-time light field based navigation requires no radiation whatsoever not only that but i'll, I'll show you a little demo mm -hmm. here so what i'm showing jason wow. is a demo of a, a spine on a table yeah. here uh, this is called a bench top simulation Incredible. And w in this case, we've placed a lot of screws into the spine, mm -hmm. which is representative of the surgery. Then they're using a titanium cobalt rod to force the spine into a different shape. Amazing. And what we're showing here is just live geometric calculation of each independent part of the anatomy moving. Mm -hmm. And we can actually just calculate that geometry live and update it in, at a moment's notice for the surgeon. And here we're backing out of that. We're undoing what we just did in the procedure to show that it's all captured live. Amazing. And what's magical about this, Jason, is this is the biggest predictor of the outcome of the surgery, both clinically and economically. Mm. This number predicts the outcome of the surgery. Amazing. So now you've got this perfect precision GPS, as we're using the analogy here. So the chances of making a mistake, the chances of a successful surgery, proper outcome is going to be dramatically increased. And the mm -hmm. number of surgeons who will eventually be able to do this surgery would not be limited. We have a surgeon shortage, correct? That's right. Probably. About 25,000 in the U.S. Uh, physician shortage, and it's growing. As, mm -hmm. as you and I age and we need more surgeries, the average American is going to need between seven and nine surgeries in their lifetime. The longer wow. we live, the more we're going to have. But we're not making surgeons fast enough. And so this is really targeted at making every surgeon as effective as they can possibly be. And, and just to put a little bit of a... A finer point on this the imax of the imax print of dune 371 gigabits <laughs> that's a two and a half hour film about 150 gigs an hour you're doing 250 gigabits a gigabytes an hour on a compressed basis yeah on a compressed basis so i mean this is m more than an imax film that you're recording <laughs> which you gotta think when you have all this data and then you start matching it to outcomes you the learning is going to go up dramatically as to um maybe what we could do better in the next surgery absolutely jason and then yeah. I, let me just challenge you to go even further than that okay right? 
Yeah. Because I'm uh, trying, my mind is trying to conceive of yeah, we're what there. happens we're, when you actually have the surgery recorded at that fidelity level. What, what can you do with that? So we get everything from the surgery. So go back to, to Elon's master plan, part one and yeah. two, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's make a car, let's make it really fast, and then let's work our way down the stack so everybody yep. has one. Okay, now, now we need a satellite and a charging station. We've got to put all those pieces together. So effectively, that's what we're doing here, is we have mm. invented the sort of tip of the spear surgical navigation platform, and it must be great. It must mm. be the best. And that earns us the right to be in the operating room capturing all these data. And of course, we can drive deep learning models and we can train AIs with the best surgeons to perform better and better and better over time. That's very exciting. And that would be enough of a cause uh, to build a company. It's a very profitable enterprise, et cetera. But I don't think that's enough for Proprio, or, and that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm mm -hmm. here to, to drive the company towards a future that is very data-driven and where the entire industry has to react. And what I mean by that is the whole medical device industry is very focused on selling Expensive capital equipment, so think about a robot that performs a surgery or an MRI machine that costs $2 million, or they're very focused on selling you a screw that goes in somebody's back. And that mm. screw costs $1,000, $1,200 a piece, and they make it for two bucks. Mm. It's the most lucrative razor, razor blades model maybe in the world, right? To break that model and reduce the cost of care while increasing the, the quality of care, we have to invent things like Proprio, the paradigm, take it into the operating room and perform and improve all these surgeries, right? But where you can break the business model is say, well, now I know what it takes to perform the surgery really well. I know who does, does well in what circumstances. I know what products, both hardware and software, can be used in that surgery to improve it. Hmm. So now you have more than one customer. You're not just going to a hospital whose finances might be, you know, challenging and saying, you got to write me a $2 million check. And maybe the most innovative thing is a capital as a service model. Now you're saying for everybody else who benefits from that surgery being performed at something approaching perfection. Mm. And I can see the gears turning, you're going, well, what about yeah. when do the insurers pay these guys? Right? Uh, yeah. When does the revenue cycle management company that goes and collects the bills for the hospital, start wanting access to this data? Yeah, when when does the Medtronic the the, the implant maker Go, well, these guys can make my implant more effective and tell me how effective it was. Yeah. I mean, so that's not, amazing when you think about it. And then how many of these surgeries do you need in order to feed it into an AI mm -hmm. and say, how do we do this better? And it's probably somewhere between 50 and 100 surgeries. I'm guessing the AI can start to have enough data to meaningfully give feedback. There's no, nothing like that going on in the world right now. Nobody's feeding an AI model these surgeries and saying, how can we make this surgery go better? Or does that exist? I think exist there's some somewhere? great, great work going on with like taking endoscope data, which uh -huh. is really, you know, video camera data of low fidelity, and trying to teach models how to recognize a, a polyp and differentiate cancerous mm -hmm. tissue and non cancerous tissue. There's been some wonderful work in those areas and intuitive surgical has a lot of data from their systems, of course. No one has gone in and mapped everything that's happening in the most important areas of the body and the anatomy and the surgery end to end and captured everything. Mm. And I, th I think that's where it's probably the most exciting area is, yeah, we can build models that, that can confirm things that we already suspected. But I think that the messy kind of belly of the beast, if you want to go Joseph, Joseph Campbell with this, yep. is what don't we know that we don't know? Yep. And what models can we build that will drive down the cost of care? Right? We're creating 10, 20, 100 opportunities to monetize the data from a surgery. Mm. I think that's where it's most exciting. And that's, that's what we're pretty fired up about here. I guess the, then the question becomes robotic surgery. And, you know, at some point, um, replacing humans in this process. And that is, I guess, been scary or the holy grail, depending on how you look at it. Eventually, you know, remote surgeries are correct me if I'm wrong, already occurring. So a surgeon can do a remote surgery across the country is it, with robotics. Is that currently the state of the art? And is that yeah. actually occurring? Or do they just get on planes and do it live? Yeah, it, so the first answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Latency issues have been the, the sort of delay in that being adopted widespread from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. But you and I are, are human beings. And, and we, you know, we would prefer our physician to be on site. Yeah. who's also a human being, in the room with us. 
even if everything goes perfectly. It's just it's yeah. much more comforting to have that hopefully world-class surgeon on site with you in the same room. And let's say if, if it was a pediatric surgery, right? If there's a child involved and I'm the parent. Yeah, of course. I'm not sure I'm comfortable having the entire thing done today. Uh, Unless by some you are a parent in a frontier market, previously known as the third world, but you know, some market where there, the surgery is not even available, mm -hmm. ex or there's not a doctor there capable of doing it, you might say, well, this remote doctor and a local crew uh, to be there in case of a problem, maybe mm -hmm. that's a, a trade off that you would want to make if you were in a frontier market. But I guess and you could also that's the fly path out that we're and, headed down, for yeah. sure. Uh, yeah. and eventually, it's you pop on a headset, you've got hundreds of thousands of surgeries and the intelligence from that all beamable in maybe via Starlink or something. And, yeah. and that intelligence is with you and on board everywhere you go. Uh, yeah. Today, it's, you know, there's too many pieces that need to work to make that happen. Mm. But if we wanted that future to be reality, we would go collect all the data from millions of surgeries to train yeah. the AI to be able to provide that guidance anytime, anywhere. And that's mm. the path we're on. When you're selling to B2B buyers, you really want to get your pitch in front of the decision maker, the person who gets to sign the check, because these upper level execs, they're the ones who make the purchasing decision. Everybody can have an opinion on the team. Of course, it's 2023, but there's always somebody where the buck stops and that buck stops on their desk and doesn't get into your bank account. These high level folks are hard to find. They're hard to target on social media platforms, but LinkedIn is the social network for business and they have 930 million members ready to do business with you. And that includes the 180 million senior level decision makers. Plus don't tell anybody there's also 10 million C level executives there. That's a ton of purchasing power. LinkedIn ads is built specifically for B2B marketers. No other platform in the world can offer these eyeballs and you can target them obviously by their location, the size of their organization, their vertical and their title. When you think about business, I want you to just think about LinkedIn. LinkedIn equals business, business equals LinkedIn. It's that simple folks. When you present them with an opportunity, they will, of course, be in the mindset to receive that because they're not posting pictures of their food from Italy on vacation. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit towards your next campaign by going to linkedin.com slash next unicorn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash next unicorn. Terms and conditions apply because LinkedIn is so generous to the This Week in Startups audience. Are you focused on one surgery, one type of surgery now uh, in terms of, you know, perfecting this and, and, and is that spinal surgeries? Uh, is that where you yeah. can do the most good? Yeah, so were? spine is very interesting. It's a great starting point. Mm. Uh, it's a very large business. It's $30 billion a year in the US in reimbursement alone. So not cap counting the capital purchases or implants or any of that side of the equation. It's just reimbursements from Medicare, Medicaid and insurers is $30 billion a year and growing mm. as the population ages, as we were discussing. So it's a good landing point. The spine is also very complex and there are a lot of unsolved problems. Mm. Um, and so we chose that for various reasons. Also, my co-founder is a brain and spine surgeon, mm. uh, as we discussed earlier of some renown. So we, we, we knew those problems really, really well. Mm. Uh, and the market rewards you for solving those big problems. So it's a good place to start. You follow the spine up, of course, it goes to the cranium. So yeah. brain surgeries, cranial surgeries make sense. Similar set of problems. Uh, believe it or not, Jason, when you open the cranium and yeah. do a craniotomy, the brain is actually under pressure and in a, a bag called the, the dura. And so when you open that up, the brain actually moves around quite a bit. Yeah. So this real-time imaging, real-time navigation, knowing where the anatomy is and what it is in 3D space live is actually unsolved in the cranial space too. Mm. And you start going through, you know, the stuff we do as entrepreneurs, right? You do that segmentation and you go, okay, well, does knee surgery have the same problem? It turns out in knee surgery, they have to put a pin, kind of like a QR code little marker in the lower leg and the upper leg above the knee and lock the knee into, into place. Why? Because they can't track it in 3D live. Mm. So does that sound familiar to what we were just discussing in spine? Yeah. Well, knee is $23 billion a year in the US alone. Wow. And so the amount of time it will take to do these surgeries should go down dramatically. What, what's the average time for spinal surgery? And then where do you think this reduces it in the coming years in terms yeah, of so time the, under the knife? Yeah. The faster ones are, you know, an hour and a half to two hours. That would be like a two level spinal fusion that happens hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of times per year in the US. 
And then the other end would be a six hour scoliosis reconstruction, like we were just going through. Um, so six hours is, is not uncommon. Now, if you added a tumor to that, that's even more complexity. Uh, and in yeah. fact, um, I happen to have one for you right here. Uh, <laughs> look at that. So yeah. this is a 3D reconstruction, a printed anatomy. And what you see, wh what we're looking at here is, is about 10 levels of a, of a human spine re reconstructed from a CT and MR scan, fused together and then printed at super high fidelity. So this is wow. probably do six people do that uh, before a surgery print out somebody's 3d print out somebody's spine like they do and isn't it crazy that this would actually be your preoperative plan wow you would print this out and very skilled surgeons we know will take in a literally i'm not kidding jason a ziploc bag because mm. <laughs> it's got to remain sterile yeah. into the operating room and hold it above the body wow. so they can visualize the anatomy subsurface while they're working and making a lot of changes to the anatomy and they're looking back and forth between this and they'll have somebody holding it for them in the OR. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? Uh, so, and what we're talking <laughs> about here, what you're holding up for the people listening is essentially a 3D printed model of somebody's spine with a big sponge of uh, pink material, which I, I assume is the tumor that's attached yep. to it. That's got to be cut out uh, without yep. uh, causing damage to the person. And what you can't see... Um, it, but I can see here because I have the benefit of it right in front of me is that it's actually inside the spinal column too. Got it. So you got to get in there between each of those. Um, yeah. So and and want, take out the, wow, that's wild. So should, back to the original the question before, is it, we know that the fidelity is going to be increased. So uh, the chance of success go up, but is it, does it meaningfully change the amount of time? Cause it does seem like the longer you're under uh, in a surgery, am I correct that the increased danger goes up? Yeah, um, th that's exactly right. So there's a number of different dangers. Um, we, we anticipate shortening surgeries from 30 to 80 minutes on average, depending upon the complexity with our yeah. system. And you can just imagine, let me give you a simple comparison. If you're going to roll in a CT scanner, which is like a giant donut. In fact, there's one mm -hmm. in the room behind me. You can kind of see over my shoulder there. That's a million dollar scanner. And if you roll it into the operating room, it's about 20 to 25 minutes to use it once. And that'll give a surgeon a sense of, of where they are in progress in the surgery. But that's 25 minutes of delay at $200 an hour minimum. So quickly, you're mm. spending five, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000 just to get a snapshot of where the anatomy is. And that now, is radiation and cost. Exactly. And time. So all of those things together, you could save 25% and then less radiation and less cost. And, exactly. And yeah. you'd be able to achieve something like this much faster and safer. Mm. So this is what I'm showing Jason here is the after of the before tumors that I showed him before. And here they've removed several levels of the, the vertebra. There's actually mm. four vertebra are gone. And what they've brought in is a substrate to strengthen wow. and support the entire spine. And you see a healthy curvature here, right? Mm. That's called lordosis and ky kyphosis. Think of it as convexity and concavity. And the level of structural support that has been brought in is just mind blowing. It's amazing. But so when you actually have that, that tumor and they have to take out the vertebrae, mm -hmm. they basically build an architecture around your spine to make up for the fact that the vertebrae have been removed, that they're not being replaced with something. Yep. And wow. this person needs to stand upright, right? And gravity is unforgiving. So physics doesn't quit. <laughs> yeah. You have to be able to go walk out into the world and they will if this surgery is done done well. The other number to take away from this is what percentage of the time are they able to actually achieve that correction of the spine mm. uh, within their targeted range? And it's about 35% of the time. Huh. And so you are now uh, FDA approved to do this. Yep. Uh, and so when does this go from being science fiction to reality? Well, as you can see behind me, it's happening now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, We're happening we, on live patients. Yep, uh, FDA clearance that? was achieved in April of this year, which is a major milestone. Um, we will likely be in live surgeries uh, again at the University of Washington doing first in human, uh, which is what's called kind of in the industry uh, within the next few weeks, Jason. Wow, that's amazing. How many years did it take you to get to here uh, in terms of research and investment? I know you can relate. Uh, seven years in the making. Overnight success, seven years in the making. <laughs> <laughs> so seven years to get this, you know, uh, two patients mm -hmm. and the venture community 
tends to have a 10 year window. And yep. so this is one of the great conundrums of our time. You could do this inside of a university, uh, yep. which is a 30 or 40 year process of grants. It's basically your entire career. And then if you look at the venture community, we have a 10 year window. And so I know that my friend Matt Ako is an investor from DCVC. Absolutely. Um, yeah. how, how does the venture community embrace a technology like this, knowing it's going to take you seven, eight years to start ringing the cash register? Mm -hmm. And that's when the end of the venture engagement and they need to start liquidating and, and giving returns to their LPs. So t tell us about the the conundrum of academia versus venture and, and and where you stand on that spectrum because it, it seems like this is a really hard needle to thread yeah exactly and i, I went back and watched your interview with matt in uh, 2019 and, oh, and yeah. by the way you were good then i'm not just blowing smoke you've been working <laughs> on this man you're, you're really good at this well you get your 10,000 hours in like a surgeon you can become a surgeon as the world's greatest moderator <laughs> that's right that's right and it, but it's it's true for for venture as well and i think what our friends at dcbc have done well is they are great at deep tech investment. And yeah. if I recall, when, when Matt laid out the framework for you, he talked about, we're not investing in companies that are making a case that there's a new physics that needs to be invented. This is not paying a bunch of PhDs to go do it, you know, deep research to see if it mm. could ever work, right? And so there is a sweet spot where, you know, we do real-time light field rendering. And once we had gotten a demonstration of that working well, um, it was... A beautiful demonstration and it, it could actually be run on a laptop and with yeah. an oculus dk2 and so you need to see that kind of a proof point and, and that's the time at which investors will come in and we need our, our friends mm -hmm. who are angel investors and our micro vc investors and and all those folks high net worth individuals to lean into these kind of technologies and bridge the gap to uh, an investor like dcvc or lux or all of our, our good friends across the valley who support these kind of things yeah and it's uh and really needs to be more of a 15 year window i think uh which is what steve jervitson's future ventures they just told everybody we're going to do 15 years they told lps mm -hmm. tell me about the fda approval process you know we there's a lot of criticism of our government here in the united states and we're dysfunctional uh yada yada takes too long it is when you look at the fda you know having to live under approvals etc does it feel like we are high functioning in terms of our approval process and getting through this or does it feel like it needs to be improved i'm trying to be generous here because i know you have to work with them yeah i appreciate that i was going to make a comment about that um <laughs> first of all it's a highly regulated environment for a reason um this is you know a lot of stake yeah there's a lot of stake um is the process perfect no um, but you, you have to look at the regulating agency as a partner right um and it's a process where you build a relationship, you're earning trust, you're building hardware and software development practices, which are documented um, that they are, uh, that, that an agency come in and look at those and say, why did you make this decision? This change to the code, mm. right? And I think this is uh, foreshadowing for the conversation about AI that we'll get further into here. Um, and you have to be, have it and be entirely explainable and auditable end to end. Now that's difficult to move fast and break things, Mm. in that kind of an environment. Um, but it is very intentionally highly regulated. So this would fall under what's called an FDA 510K process, which is really a smart um, highway that was built. Um, and that's a reference to the, the sort of the code and the regulations that says if there's a product that has some substantial equivalence, right? A camera system that does this and a camera system that does that plus more, you can start with a 510K, which will accelerate your process to market. There's certain mm. stringent proof points you have to hit. And if it's accurate and if it's faster or whatever those criteria are, FDA, if you meet those bars, FDA will give you a, basically a, a slight fast track to market. Got it. So if it recognizes you're building and you're standing on the shoulders yep. of existing technology, they can fast track you a little bit and not make it you start from zero uh and i guess in your case the sensor arrays and being able to uh build off of that which already exists um yep. what would help you the smart strategy there which is what we've pursued is not try to boil the entire ocean day one that's going to be confusing for a regulatory mm. body you know wh and what is the key innovation here and what what are you enabling today and where are the proof points and where's the 10-year patient outcome study 
Um, so that's not a great strategy for dealing with FDA. That makes them nervous, understandably. Yeah. And so what you want to do is go stepwise through, build a platform, get that cleared, then come layer different software packages and upgrades. And as you said, expand the surgical adjacencies, go after knees and cranial and those kind of applications, if that's where we're going. Um, and those are, those are essentially additions to the regulatory mm. strategy. And that's and much get, less confusing yeah. for FDA. To get to this point in time, seven, eight years, about $100 million to, to get a product like this over the finish line, yeah? That's a good guess. Um, we went to very educated folks in the space early on, and I'm a very competitive person. I don't know about you, yeah. uh, but I got them to kind of outline what it's taken to bring DaVinci and other systems to market. And it was about 10 years, $100 million was the estimate uh, for, for deep tech uh, execution and innovation in the space. And I'm, I'm happy to report that we're uh, at least three years and mm. um, tens of millions of dollars ahead of that schedule. Fantastic. Which is which is exciting and it, it affords us the opportunity to engage with the investment community to build a lot more on top of the platform we've already built and launched. Well, listen, uh, it's just great that you're out there doing this kind of work. Um, and it's great that all of this activity <laughs> from smartphones and video game consoles and PC based video games uh, and Nvidia uh, storage. I mean, you couldn't do this without having a massive amount of storage, you couldn't do it without having these sensors dramatically drop down in price although you can spend a little bit more money on sensors that sensor array has got to be ten twenty thousand dollars worth of sensors i would take it when you're that's not a bad es estimate jason yeah it's well i mean if you just think self-driving cars have forty thousand thirty forty thousand dollars worth of sensors if they're using lidar mm -hmm. this feels like it's a little more it, it's directional so you don't need to have it in f four different directions you just have this in one direction basically so it would be yep. uh, slightly less but we have an advantage in that it's on a robotic arm. And so we know where the robot mm -hmm. is. So it gives us a computational uh, head start. We don't need to compute the entire world. Yeah. Right? We're very focused on the area that matters most to the surgeon. And that accelerates things quite a bit. Well, I know you're hiring. And so everybody should go to the website now, uh, which is P-R-O-P-R-I-O vision.com. And uh, yeah, go to the careers page. What are you looking for in terms of needs in terms of you know high tech folks who can come and help you reduce suffering and, and, and increase uh the availability of these high-end surgeries to people around the planet what do you need yeah th thanks for shining a light on that jason um to do something as ambitious as this right it's not one type of software engineer or hardware engineer you need right we need computer vision ai robotics augmented reality medical device software and hardware engineering uh, and we have all those things here in seattle uh, and we guess we're growing on all fronts. Amazing. So if you're interested in solving meaningful problems that are unsolved today, clinically, um, both in spine surgery and beyond, we would love to talk to you. Yeah, go to the career uh, page. Please, I see you, have, you need out. a Unity to engineer. <laughs> so you're using Unity as the 3D modeling environment? Uh, um, it's, it's useful for a lot. Uh, you, you alluded to it. You nailed it. Yeah. So the video game development environment. We not only like video game players, I think yeah. I'm working here for but we like uh, you know, software engineers who've worked in that environment. And part of that is thinking ahead to applications that other companies and teams will develop, mm. right? I don't need to reinvent all of the wheels or every single app that's going to live on our ecosystem or have an API to plug in to our data. If you are skilled in developing in a Unity environment, and you have a product that you think could be amplified yeah. by working with Proprio with our singular data set, we would like to hear from you too. Amazing. Well, listen, continued success. Thanks so much for sharing uh, this incredible progress. And so coming to an OR near you uh, soon. Uh, thanks so much, Gabriel, for joining us. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.